Welcome, everyone, to Biblical Foundations. My name is Pastor Randy Craighead, and this week I'm going to talk about, this is lesson three, I'm going to talk about living right. In week one, I talked about your new life in Christ. What does it mean to be saved? Many of you came to Christ and didn't really understand the mechanics of what does it mean to be saved, so I broke all that down. And last week, I talked about what does it mean to be right in Christ, and, uh, I, that, and that's a big topic I unpack called justification. It's a big biblical word, but it's a really cool word. And, uh, and I talked about what does it mean to be justified. And this week, I want to talk about what does it mean to live right in Christ? How do, we walk this th- how do we walk this Christian life out? I mean, what is all that about? And uh, I want to unpack that. So uh, this week, I want to talk about what does it mean to live right? What does it mean to live right? And so I wrote this down. God's goal is for us to become more like Jesus, that's important, to be conformed and to the image of Christ, to be like Jesus. Uh, years ago, uh, there was a, a family in the church, a, a couple, and, um, and uh, so they asked us to come over to eat. So it was me, it was my wife and I, and, and it was just my daughter at the time. And she, I guess she was probably, I don't know, she was probably eight or nine years old, something like that, maybe seven. And so we go there, and uh, they were so nice, and they were so just friendly, and, uh, and her name was Miss Lynn, and Miss Lynn was just serving us, and it was just, it was just a beautiful meal, and just, we just had the best time. And so we said our goodbyes to she and her husband, and we were driving home, and they lived out in the country, and, and we were just driving home. It was kind of quiet in the car. It was late, you know. And my daughter was sitting in the back seat, and, uh, and she goes, hey, Pops, uh, what was that lady's name again? I said, oh, her name is Miss Lynn. And she goes, she's like Jesus. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And she really is like Jesus. I mean, just amazing. I've never forgot that. Here's a lady in Christ that made an impression upon a seven or eight-year-old young girl that she's like Jesus. And what is, that's really what we're talking about today. Is this, what, what, what do we need to do in our lives to be what? To become more like Jesus, to be conformed into the image of Christ. And so, here's our verse. Here's kind of our theme verse uh, for this lesson in Romans 8, 29. It says this, for those whom he fore, those believers, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be, there's our word, conformed to the image of his son, Jesus, so that he or she might be the firstborn among many brothers, our brethren. And so that's our verse. It's so conform. And this is the cool thing about this word, conform. It's the Greek word, somorphous. That's a cool word. And really what that means is the same form as. So we are to be conformed. We are to be in the same form as Christ. That's, 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 that's our goal in life. And we never really arrive 100% until we get to heaven. We have our glorified body. But our goal in life is, and that's why we read the Word of God, that's why we get into His Word, because we're trying to understand how did Christ live? How did He walk? How did He talk? You know, how did He relate to people? How did He talk back? I mean, what did He do? How did He respond? How did He react? And so we learn that from Christ, and that's that's called becoming, coming into the same form as putting the image on of Christ, that we're conformed into the image of Christ. Well, how he responds and so forth, like I talked about. So conforming it to the image of Christ uh, is, is a sort of a kind of what we call a moral renovation. Because before we come to Christ, you know, there's no telling what we've done, what we've been like, and, you know, and all how we think. Somebody once said we had a lot of stinking thinking before we came to Christ, right? I know I did. And so when we come to Christ, it's, it's kind of this moral renovation that begins to take place in us. Once we, just, once we come to the cross and we're justified... And we come to the cross, and then we walk out a life that's called uh, sanctification, living right. And so conforming into the image of Christ is kind of like a moral renovation in which we, what, are increasingly changed from what we once were, not by our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love that, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it uh, on our own. So let's break this down a little bit more. What I'm talking about, living right, is really what the Bible calls sanctification. Last week, I talked about 
justification. And what was justification? Justification is when you come to Christ, you come to the cross, you realize your need for Christ, and you don't want to live the way you used to live. And when you ask Christ to come into your life and take the reins of your life, justification is where Christ, it's an instantaneous legal act in which Christ declares you justified. And you're not justified on your own righteousness, on your own works, but you, the Bible says that we're actually cloaked with the robe of righteousness. And that's the, way, that's the way God sees us. We're cloaked with Christ's righteousness, not a righteousness on our own. So justification is a birth. That's when we were born again. And sanctification is a growth process. It's where we're growing in Christ. And we're participating and responding to the inner voice of the Holy Spirit. So sanctification begins when we get saved, and it continues <clears throat> throughout all of our life. Now, I put this little graph up here because I think it just perfectly illustrates this whole concept of what does it mean to walk a sanctified life? What does it mean to live right or to, yeah, living right? So here we are. If you, if you look down here, you can see at this point, it's kind of a scraggly little line here. This is where we, 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 how we were or when we were non-Christian. We, we didn't, when we were slaves, as the Bible says, we were slaves to sin. So we were down, we had no real revelation of Christ in our life. We, we were not saved. And all of a sudden, we encounter the cross, and whoop, we come up, and we, and we get saved. And now, we begin to enter into this growing in holiness, this growth process, this process of sanctification, where we're learning how to read our Bible, we're learning how to pray, we're learning how to get into a small group, we're learning how to change some things in our life through the power of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, the way we think is not like we used to think. The way we live is not like we used to live. The way we talk is not like the way we used to talk. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves growing, and we become more and more sanctified. We, we're living a more righteous life as it relates to a lot of behavioral things. And so we're just, we're just living right. And, and, all, and we can see a growth process begins, begins to take place. I mean, you've probably heard <clears throat> this before. You know, oh, this person, they're a really mature Christian. Let's unpack that. What does that mean? That means they've been growing. They've been in his word. They've been going to church. They've been studying the word of God. They've been praying. They've been reading. They've been, they've been, they've, they've been allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to them through this word. And their life is beginning to take a different form outwardly and inwardly, the way you think. And so a mature Christian is moving along in life, and all of a sudden we die. See, we never arrive at full uh, sanctification, okay? So we're constantly growing, and I'm going I'm, I'm I'm to uh, talk about that in a moment, why that's the case. But in, and eventually we die, and then when we die, we're fully sanctified, and we go right to, we're in perfect holiness when we die because the Bible says that when we die, we have, the, we have a glorified body. Okay, and in that particular body, there is no sin. Okay, all right. So that's that's how it is. So that's this is a little bit. I think it's good for people to see this because you can see, and you can kind of like, uh, kind of find your maybe your, your place on the graph, right? Because this is time on the x-axis, and this is our growth process on the y-axis here. So this is you can kind of. I've seen people. That, I mean, I've seen people just like whew, when they when they, after they become a Christian. They just like, ooh, they just go way up really, really fast. I mean, they're just really growing there in the, in the Word of God. But I've seen some people, they just kind of, <laughs> they just kind of flatline, and their growth process is really kind of a, a slow burn. And, and they're just, and, and, and it's unfortunate. The Bible talks about people like this, that they're still babes in Christ. I mean, when I'm 80 years old, hopefully I've applied enough of the Bible that I'm, not a, I'm, not, I'm still not a babe in Christ. I heard somebody say this one time, it's a terrible thing when you have to part the whiskers to put the bottle in, right? So say a lot, think about that. But I don't wanna, I don't wanna take a slow burn on sanctification. I wanna, I wanna just, I wanna, I wanna really learn and just hunker down and I wanna be the best person I can, I can possibly be living a sanctified life. Now, here's the problem, okay? <laughs> here's the big challenge to what? Living right. And the challenge and the problem is the flesh guy, okay? What's the, this earth suit that we're living, this, this flesh, that, that, this is our problem. 
That's why we have challenges. And hey, listen, uh, I, have, I have challenges. You have challenges. Why is that? Because we still have this, we have this earth body. Like, it, like I showed you on the graph earlier, you don't have the glorified body until you die. So we have the process of sanctification works out when you're still breathing, all right? Now, look what the, look what the apostle Paul said. How do, he, he's, kind of, he's painting a picture of the war that's inside of us with our flesh, okay? He says this, the Apostle Paul to the church at Galatia. <clears throat> he says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the what? Flesh. For the flesh lust, or I wrote in parentheses, wars. There's a battle. There's a warring going on. So the flesh wars against the Spirit the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit that lives inside of you, your flesh wars against that, and the Spirit against the flesh. So there's, a, there's this tug of war that takes place. These are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things. You are, you, you, so in your mind, you're trying to do the right things, but your flesh is trying to pull you back so that you may not do the things or the right things that, really, that, that you please. And so that, that's a picture. The Paul he painted this picture so beautifully, and that is absolutely the case. And everybody, I think, knows exactly what I'm talking about. So what is the flesh? It's our body. It's our human body. It's what we live in. It's what we're born with. And we can never get rid of it until the day we die. The flesh is our, and what is that? It's our carnal, innate tendencies. It's, it's, these, it's this carnality that's inside of us that always has a tendency to want to do what it wants to do, Okay. It, it's, it's, and it never goes away. It's always just kind of resident there, all right? Our flesh is our most immediate enemy. It's the most immediate enemy. When you get saved, that's why we tell people, now that you've given your heart to Christ, the thing you need to do is you need to get around other believers. That's why we, that's why we push small groups so much. You need to be around other believers who, in re, who can reinforce the Christian godly lifestyle and that are in this word and helping you and praying with you and helping you to grow and, and just right there with you when you're struggling. So that's our most immediate enemy. And here's another thing. Desire alone is not good enough to battle the flesh. We're at war. We're to war against the flesh. I mean, you can't be, <clears throat> you can't be, you've heard this before, a conscientious objector. You just can't be a conscientious objector. You have to you have to put your armor on and fight against the, fight against the enemy because it's a real battle, all right? So the Bible says we're to war against this flesh. All right. Now, I want to show you this verse here because this is Apostle Paul again, and now he's writing to the, the, work, the church at Rome, and he's telling them this, and he begins to do a little bit deeper dive. So in Galatians... He talked about the con this concept of warring back and forth. Then he gets really transparent, and he gets very vulnerable. And because when he's in Rome, he's in prison, so he's got a lot of time to think about this. And he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So he gets very transparent, and he begins to tell of his, how this battle works in, his, in, in himself. And so watch this as we unpack this. So I find, Apostle Paul, I find that as a rule... That when I, and I put in parentheses the, uh, the spirit versus the law of sin, he says, when I, he's talking about his spirit, want to do what's right, what's good. See, the, the law of sin doesn't want to do what's good. That's how we know it's, it's, it's this Holy Spirit. When I want to do what is good, look at this. Evil is right there with me, all right? I, my spirit, gladly agrees with the, with the law, God's law. On the inside, but I see a different law, the law of what? Sin, okay? That law of sin that's resonant in my body, okay? You can't get rid of it until the day you die. It's, it's at work in my body, in my physical body, and in my mind. It wages a war against the law of my mind, my spirit. I'm, I'm in, my, I'm in my mind, I want to do what's right, but, this, but I have this battle inside of me. And it takes me prisoner with the law of sin that is in my body. I am a miserable human being. Wow. Wow, what a struggle. I am a miserable human. And he says, who, 
will deliver me from this dead corpse. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty vivid. And, what, and so Paul, is, it's so cool how he writes this because uh, in Roman times, if you murdered someone, if you killed somebody, all right, uh, it was the death penalty. Okay, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, so whole thing. And so the way, one of the ways they would do this, at times they would do this, they would take this per- person, the perpetrator, who murdered someone, and they would put them in stocks out in, in, a, in a plaza or a courtyard, and they put them in stocks for everybody to see. This person is a murderer. And they'd have him in stocks. And you know what they would do? Wow, this, only the Romans can think of stuff like this. They would take that dead corpse of the person he just killed, and they'd strap it on his back. And as that body decayed, he'd have to, he'd be, he'd be in, that person would be in those stocks with the person he just killed on his back. And he'd, he'd stay there until that decaying body would poison his body. He'd eventually die. Wow, what a, wow. What a word picture. And, he's, and he's, that's what he says. I'm like the man in the stocks. He goes, who's going to deliver me from this dead corpse strapped on me? And, he, and, he, and, and I love it. He didn't say, what will deliver me? He said, who will deliver me? And he goes, thank God. He gets excited. Thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And big exclamation point. And he says this, so then I'm a slave to God's law in my mind, but I'm a slave to sin's law in my body. Now, I'm going to unpack that just a little bit more, okay? This is one of my favorite illustrations. And uh, this, and I drew two circles, and I drew it up there like this so you can see it. Hopefully, you'll you'll get the point. But I want to talk about uh, uh, Rebecca. That was the wife of Isaac. It was Abraham, Isaac, and Abraham had a son, Isaac. And Isaac married Rebecca, okay? And Rebecca prayed and, uh, for, for, for children, and she, got, she, she became pregnant. She had twins, all right? And it's interesting. God came to her when she was pregnant with these twins, and he said something very, very interesting. And there's a lot to it, but I'm just going to give you kind of the, the, the gist of it. So, so here's Rebecca. She's pregnant with twins, with, with Jacob and Esau, all right? And so, when she, and so he, there's a prophecy that, com, that comes forth uh, in Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. And it says, and the older shall serve the younger. And so what happened when Rebecca, when she was, about to deli- when she was delivering the child, so the first son comes forth, and, and, it, was, and it was Esau. And an interesting thing happened that uh, when he was being birthed, uh, th- th- his, his brother, the twin, uh, Jacob reached out and grabbed his, his ankle and, and grabbed his ankle and then came out. And so uh, it said, so, so the older was Esau and Jacob with the younger uh, grabbed the ankle of Esau. And what I want, so it's interesting because the Bible says God told Rebecca that these two people, these twins in your womb, are going to be two different, distinct peoples, and they're going to be two nations, and they're going to have two different natures. And so I say all that because I think it gives a beautiful picture of the struggle and the battle and the war that the Apostle Paul talks about uh, how, living out this life. There's two natures inside of us. When you become born again, I mean, before you were born again, you had that sinful nature. And let me tell you something, it was large and in charge, all right? But when Christ came to live in you and you were born again, all of a sudden, you have a new nature inside of you. There, so, it's, so this new nature shows up on the block, and there's this old nature there, okay? He's, and what is that? The tendencies, the way that you still, the way you, all the things I talked about, your thinking, your behavior, all this stuff, the way you talk, and all this kind of stuff, that, that, that's your old man or your old woman, Okay? So when you become born again, all of a sudden, Christ lives inside of you, and there's a new nature that you begin to learn about through God's Word and also through the, through the voice of the Holy Spirit, all right? And so over time, so remember the Bible said the older shall serve the younger? That's the goal. You want that older nature, the one that's at war with you all the time. The older nature is to serve the new nature, the new kid on the block, all right? And so... So the new nature, and I, and I put it over here. So here's Esau and Jacob. They're in the womb. 
And, and so, so this Jacob represents your, your new life in Christ. So what you want to do is you want to keep feeding Jacob this new life. You want to keep feeding that, the new spirit that's inside of you, and all of a sudden it will begin to grow. It begins to grow. And then, and then your Esau over here, then he'll become more and more min minimized, the old man. So this is the new picture of the new man or the new woman that you're feeding with the word of God and prayer and all these cool things, going to church. All, and so you're growing. And so that new nature inside of you begins to grow. And then the old nature inside of you is minimized. But here's the thing. It never goes away. It never goes away until you're in heaven. So there's always resident inside of you this old man, this old nature. And here's the life axiom. I wrote it right here. Here's the life axiom. And, and just, you need to write this down. Uh, I remember when you were in class, when you're fourth grade teacher, when you, you maybe cut up or something, you know, you know, I will be nice in class, I will be nice in class, I will be nice in class, or I will not talk in class. I will write that a hundred times. You need to, all of us need to write this maybe a thousand times. But here's the life axiom. What you feed grows and what you starve dies. If you keep feed, if you over here, you keep feeding this new man, it's going to grow. It's going to be large and in charge. You're going to be, your, your thinking's going to change. The way you talk changes. Your behavior changes. Your wife's going to notice a difference. Your, your, your co-worker's going to notice a difference in you. Why is that? Because you're feeding, you're feeding that new man. All of a sudden, life begins to come out and new ways of, new ways of living. But here's the thing. If you stop feeding that, that new man and you start feeding that old man, that old man can start growing again. That old, that, that, I hate to say like just the old woman, but I'm just trying to be gender neutral here. But that old person, that old nature in you can begin, it will begin to grow again. And you'll start feeling weak. You'll start feeling, and I hear this sometimes, I'm so dry. I'm so spiritually dry. Well, why is that? Have you been coming to the church? Have you been reading your Bible? Have you, are you a small group? Are you praying? Those are the things that keep the fervor and the zeal alive of the Christian life. So you, got, you have to keep feeding your new man. You just can't say, you can't read a verse, you know, once a month and go, I'm good. No. <laughs> you know, can you live on one cracker a month? I don't think so. All right? So, you know, we're, the way we're designed, we're supposed to, we, we typically, some people have five meals a day, but we're supposed to live on like three meals a day, right? And so, you know, so we have to be constantly in the Word of God. So, anyway, I wanted to show you that. I think that can help you. And here's another. I want to give, I'm giving you as many illustrations as I can because this is the fight. This is the fight of how to live your new life in Christ. All right. So here's another biblical picture. All right. So remember when the children of Israel, so this is a picture of the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Jordan River, and this is the Promised Land, and this is the, this is the, coast, the, the coast of Israel. Canaan, and I just put that there as blue. It's the Mediterranean Sea. I kind of did that with the PowerPoint. But anyway, I think you get the picture. <clears throat> and so, so down here would be Egypt. So Moses delivers the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they come around. They circle around 40 years, and they come up on the east side of the Dead Sea, and they, and they camp about right here, all right? So they camp, and they get ready to come across the Jordan River, right? And God spoke to Joshua and said, listen, I've given you the land. This is what he said in Numbers 33, 53 to Moses. John. He said, take possession of the land and settle in it. For I have, some versions say, already given you. I have given you the land to possess. And what was that? Well, we know right off the bat they had to go in. They had to take over Jericho. Then it was Ai. Then it was Gilgal. Then it was a bunch of cities after that. So they can't, but God gave them a promise that you're going to go over into the promised land, and I've already given it to you. You just have to go in and take it over. But it's yours. You just have to go get it. You have to take possession. And it's interesting. There were 30, if you study it, there's 31 kings that they had to conquer. And I like in this word picture that when you come to Christ, I'm just, I'm just using the, this biblical number here, but there's, quote, 31 kings that need to be conquered in our lives. And what are those? Like I've made many references, your thinking is one thing, all right? And the way you behave and the way you respond. And, and so this, these are areas. Maybe you have an anger problem, all right? These are areas, these are kings in your life that need to be conquered. And so, but here's the cool thing. 
God says, I've already, I've already given you possession of it. You just have to go in and take it over. So God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have the ability through his power inside of you, resident inside of you, you can go in and take that whatever, quote, king is, and take, defeat that king and in your life. Maybe it's a bondage or stronghold. Maybe it's a sex addiction. Maybe it's an alcohol addiction or drug addiction or whatever some of these, these kind of things are. You know, it, it just, it just, maybe these, these bondages and these strongholds that you have in your life, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to live that. You can be sanctified. You can be delivered. And what's so cool, we have, uh, we have freedom around here twice a year that you can come and you can live a free life. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And so you can go in and take possession and conquer uh, those areas in your life. Now, as we carry on here, I want to give you seven uh, ways to live holy. Seven ways. I mean, some people could probably come up with 25 ways, but I, I got seven here. But there's seven ways to live holy. Now, I'm not talking about, I didn't mention this before. Let me mention this now. So justification and sanctification, and you can look at it this way, are like two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. Justification, instantaneous legal act where you're saved. And then, and then you got sanctification where it's the process of walking the Christian life out and becoming. And so what, is that, what does all this mean when you're justified and you're sanctified? It means that you're holy. The word sanctification or, or sanctify means to set apart, to be holy. So what are you doing? What are you, when, you, when, you're, when you're coupling justification with sanctification is that you're becoming holy. You're, you're becoming holy. And people, and it's, that's kind of a, it seems like it's kind of an archaic word, you know. I'm living a holy lifestyle. I'm walking in holiness. There's nothing wrong with saying that. That's a, that's a good word. In the Old Testament, and, and, and when we get to heaven, we're going to hear that all the time. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're going to hear that all the time. And so, the word holy, so when you're living this way, when you're living in God's word, you're living a life of holiness, and it's inward. It's not, you know, it's not like the seven, the seven, uh, the seven uh, paths of righteousness to enlightenment the Buddhists teach. You go to nirvana. No, that's not, we're not talking about this, the seven principles of enlightenment. No, it's not some pathway. Some people think it's our behavior. Some people think it's the, the clothes that you wear or the length of your hair. Those kind of things. No, it's not behavioral. This is, this is, in, this is inward. Inward. But it, ha, it works outward, but God does the work inside of you. And so, uh, seven ways to live holy or to be sanctified. <clears throat> Number one, I think to start right, start right off is that you need to believe God is for you. Believe that God is for you. So many people have the wrong concept that God is some distant person up there. He's mad at you. He's got a baseball bat, and he can't wait to hit you over the top of the head. That is such a, just an erroneous uh, concept of who God is. God is for us. He loves us. We're his children. And I love this verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, Jeremiah 29, 11. It says this, for I, who's I? God, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Here's the thing. God is for you. Man, <clears throat> when you know that, wow, that should, get, that should just give you, put a steel, a, rod in your back, a, steel, a, rod, a steel rod in your backbone. You're like, man, I can do anything. I can do anything. So you need to know that God is for you right off the bat, okay? That when something happens, you know, I know I messed up. Oh, my Lord. But if you go to the Father and you repent, God is for you. He'll welcome you with open arms. Okay. And number two. All right. Number two. <clears throat> so you, number one, believe that God's for you. Know, know that God is for you. Number two, you need to embrace your new identity as Christ. Begin to understand who you are and what your identity is. You, you have a new passport now. You have a new ID. You have a new, quote, driver's license. All right. You need to embrace your new identity in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone, is, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. So how do we do that? So here's some practical things. We need to apply the values of Christ. 
his values. Well, where do we get these values? Again, back in his word. We apply these values that we read, his concepts, his precepts, the values that are in, this, in the Bible here. We begin to apply those to our life. See, we just don't want to... Here's the thing. You can't... In, you, it's almost impossible to engage as a believer. It's impossible to engage in God's word as a passive bystander. It's, it's almost impossible. Because why is that? Because you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. This word was written and inspired by the Holy Spirit through, through men. And, and so this word was written. And so the Holy Spirit, so when you're reading it, when you read it, all of a sudden, the, whole, the inner witness, you, 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 the, the Holy Spirit inside of you resonates with something you just read. And all of a sudden, you go, ooh, wow, that's amazing. Or, ouch, I need to change. <laughs> right? And so you, you can't passively engage in the Word of God. It's, it's almost, it's practically impossible. So you have to apply, and we learn these values. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so we apply the values of Christ, not the values of the world. See, the world's values are not your values. They're not your values. You know, uh, uh, Jerry Springer's values are not your values or whoever is on that show typically, okay? Uh, so we don't apply uh, those values. No, we go to the Word of God. I'm being a little facetious there. but So they, here's the scripture, John 17, 14 says, they, the disciples, are not of the world. This is Jesus saying this just as I'm not of the world. So, so you're in the world. We live in the world, but we're not of the world, okay? We're not of the world. When you, when you ask Christ to come into your life, you enter into a new kingdom, into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So we're no longer of this world. We're, we're in the world, we're not of the world. Another, what I mean by that is that uh, we're not allowing the world's way, the world's system, to define who we are. The Word of God defines who we are. All right, now, number three, again, how do you live a sanctified life? How do you live a holy life? Well, you know, when we mess up, what do we do? We confess and repent of any sin in our life. That's what we do. We confess and repent of any sin in our life. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John uh, 1, 9. That's number three. So, uh, number four. All right, and this is a big one. <clears throat> They're all big, but here's, here's another one that's really, really big, okay? Because this is, this, is where the <laughs> the, this is where the battle is most of the time, the battlefield of the mind. Number four is that we need to renew our mind, renew our mind. And the classic Scripture for this is in Romans 12, 2, Apostle Paul's talking here. Do not be, do not conform, remember? Don't get into the same form as, remember that somorphous, the Greek word for that? Remember we talked about that? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be ye what? Transformed. And that word right there is such a cool word because in the Greek, the Greek word is metamorphous. Okay, and so our metamorphosis, as we say nowadays, it's almost an exact transliteration of the word, the Greek word, transform. In other words, be, it's a metamorphosis that takes place. When you come in Christ and you're living, when you're in this word and you're living in, 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 by this word and you're applying the values and the concepts and the precepts and the statutes the Bible calls about, all of a sudden, there's a metamorphosis that begins to take place in, in your spirit, in your mind. And your will, and your emotions, and all of a sudden, there's a metamorphosis that begins to take place. You, maybe, you're, maybe you're a very strong-willed person. Nothing about being strong-willed, but you don't want to be strong-willed all the time. You know, maybe it's, you know, it's times where you need to be strong about something. But if you live constantly where you're just aggravating, every, uh, aggravating people all the time, and you just you can't hardly get along with anybody because of your, quote, quote he's a strong-willed person, or she's a strong-willed person, uh, that needs to probably change a little bit, okay? And so as you get in, in God's Word, all of a sudden you find out, you know, that, that your, your will begins, begin, begins to be more tempered, more tempered. Maybe it's your emotions. Maybe your emotions are all over the place all the time. But as you get in God's Word, uh, there's a metamorphosis that begins to take place. And all of a sudden you can become a little bit more settled, okay? There's not so much drama going on all the time because you're settled in your soul. 
and in your mind. Here's the big one, the big one. So do not be conformed to the back, but be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the metamorphosis of your mind. And so uh, how do we do that practically, okay? So some of these, I'm going to give you some very practical examples. Here's one. So if, if, I'm, if I'm to live transformed, if I'm to allow the spiritual metamorphosis and this, this, these metamorphoses to take place in my mind, my emotions, and my will, how do I do that? What the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In other words, I wrote this down. Don't allow your mind to wander in the wrong direction. Take every thought captive. You know, at the rodeo, when you go to the rodeo and you see the, you see the guy or the girl up there with the lasso and they, whoop, they throw it down at the, at the calf's feet and they pull it back and they, la- they jump off the horse and they go over there and they, they tie the, the calf up and they, whoop, they put their hands up and they just lassoed that calf. That's what we need to do to wandering thoughts that are not God's thoughts. If a thought comes into your mind, here's the thing. A thought that comes into your mind is not sin, but if a thought that comes into your mind, you start meditating it on it, it drops into your heart, then it can become, become sinful. Become sinful. Martin Luther said this, it's not the birds that fly over your head are the problem, it's the birds that land on your head and make a nest. You don't want any wrong thought to begin nesting in your brain because it drops into your heart, and then there could be a sinful outcome that comes there. So we want to we want to lasso. Don't just let your mind wander. I, I have a very active imagination, and my mind can do, 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 do a lot of things and just kind of go different places. I've had to learn over the years, like whoop, I have to bring those, bring my mind into check. I have to self regulate at some, and I I don't do it just on my own. I ask the Holy Spirit to help me. Okay, so you just, you have to use spiritual self regulation. You just can't let your mind just go whoop, just go all over the place because it will go in the wrong direction. Typically. The Bible says this, that before the, the flood came with Noah, before the flood, the waters came and flooded the earth, this, this is a scary verse. Scary. It says the thoughts and intents of man were evil all the time. Wow. Wow. See, that was, that was, it was total deregulation of their mind. It's crazy. All right, so don't allow your, your mind to go and, I hope, you're, I, hope this, I hope this is landing, okay, because I'm meaning it with the right spirit, hopefully constructively. <clears throat> so don't allow your, your mind just to wander off and just like, oh, I'm just letting my mind go because, you know, I want to embrace creativity and I just want to just kind of think of everything I can think of. Woo! I mean, there's a time where you can do that, but you're going to have to self-regulate that. You just can't let your mind go all over the place. All right, now, here's the second thing. We're talking about renewing our mind. So here's the second thing. You have to reject sinful thoughts. You have to reject that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we want to thank, and I love this, we need to thank Philippians' thoughts. And what, is, what are Philippians' thoughts? Well, that comes from the verse here, Philippians 4, 8, and it says this. So, so one of the ways, all right, that, that we, start, we start combing through our mind and, and, and allowing our mind to transform is we have to start thinking on different things, Right? And so Paul's telling the church at Philippi, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That is so practical. So practical. So Paul gives us a kind of a rubric or a grid to, to, to pu- push our thinking through. And so this is, so if it doesn't line up with one of these things, then, then we probably ought to not be thinking about it, right? And so, so this was a beautiful grid for us to learn. And you start doing this, and all of a sudden your mind's going to begin to be transformed. All right, now let's go to the next one here. <clears throat> Number five. Now, I love this one too, Okay. So we're talking about, about, you know, how do we live right? And these are just very practical things. This is very practical. Why is that? Why are we talking about practicalities right now? Because, because of the war that takes place in our bodies and in our mind. So number five, we need to apply the put-off, put-on principle. All right? 
So what is that, Pastor Randy? Okay, so this comes out out of the book of Colossians. So again, Apostle Paul, Apostle, the reason I refer to Apostle Paul so much because he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, okay? So this is in the book of Colossians. And this, Paul gets right down to the nitty-gritty. I mean, it's like he doesn't leave any stone unturned here. I mean, he gets right down to where we live, okay? So this is what he says, okay? For, in order for us to live right, okay, there's some things that we have to put off, but there's some things we have to put on. Very important. And this, and this is daily. It's hourly. It's minute by minute at times. I mean, because the life that we live is driving down the street and seeing things and hearing things or whatever. I mean, we have to do the put off, put on dance constantly. All right? So what is that? Now listen to this. Therefore, put to death... I'm going to talk about putting off. What are the things we have to put off? Therefore, put to death your members. That's your flesh, okay? So put to death your members which are on the earth. That's us. And here are the things that we got to put death to. Watch this. Fornication. What is that? That's sex outside of marriage, you know? So I hate to say this, but just sleeping around and cohabitating, all that kind of stuff, not cool. I didn't say that. The Bible said that, okay? So no sex outside of marriage, all right? uncleanness, passion, that's evil passion, evil desire, covetousness, coveting other people's stuff, you know, uh, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience or the daughters of disobedience. I mean, that's, that's he's saying this, God, the Holy Spirit, God is saying this to the Apostle Paul, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived with them. In other words, that's how we used to live. That's what this, he's saying. These are some of the things we used to do, right? But now, now what? Now that you're saved, now that you're justified and you're trying to live out this sanctified life, now that you've become a born again, now that you've become holy in God, he says, but now you yourselves, I love that, you yourselves, all right? He's putting it right, he's putting the bullseye right on, on us, okay? You are to, you yourselves are to put off all these things we talked about, fornication, uncleanness, evil desire, all that kind of stuff. Put off those things. It's like, just shirk those things. Put them off. And, and or to put off all these things. And he gives another list. All right? He says, he says, here's some other things we have to put off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. As a, I'm just going to say this. As a believer... Okay, as a Christian, your language and your mouth ought to start cleaning up. <laughs> okay, all right? And it's not washing it out with palm olive or Irish spring or dove soap. I mean, you can do that if you want, but it typically doesn't work, okay? No, your language should begin to clean up. It's a filthy language out of your mouth or, you know, dirty old nasty jokes that, you, that we hear sometimes. You know, no, no, that, that needs to stop. He says, do not lie. Here's some other thing. Don't lie to one another. Since you have what? We're not going to do that because we've put off the old man with his deeds. Wow. So that's a whole list. And you can go back to that list if you want to. So here's, here's some things that we have to put on. So we just don't shirk them off and go like, okay, I guess I'm doing okay. No, we have to put on some things. Okay. This is where the metamorphosis takes place. This is when we, we have to change. Okay. We have to renew. So right here, so here's some things we have to do. So now he continues on, Colossians 3.10. Put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge. And where does that knowledge come from? According to the image of him, Christ who created him. The knowledge is coming from Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Word. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, this, now, now we put off, now we got to put on, right? we got to put on what? And I love this, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, he puts it right on, you have to help, you, because Christ forgave you, you have to forgive other people. So you, all must, you also must do. But above all these things, this is, we got to put on all these things, but, but here's like the big one, put on Love. Make sure you're walking through this world with love. Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Wow, 
the thing that glues all of these wonderful things together, these attributes, these characteristics, is, is the bond of love. And boy, if you start putting off all those old things and putting on a new thing, you are going to be, people are going to wake up and they're going to notice, you know, you're not the same person anymore. All right? And so how do we do this? Number six, we have to constantly admit our dependence on the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We can't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. You know, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you're kind of stuck right here. <laughs> you, you can't get it all the way up. You can't do it. We can't. That's a picture of you can't do it by yourself. You can't. And the Apostle Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we're walking in the Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right, number seven. A few more things here under number seven and we'll be done. Number seven, I wrote, it, I wrote this down. Location, location, location. You know how it is in the restaurant business, you know? What's the number one thing you, you, that restaurateurs are looking for? You know, the right location. And so it's location, location, location. And what, is, what do I mean by that, okay? We need to find a place every day to read God's Word. It's very important. You need to find, it'd be, it'd be nice, and maybe I mean, it might be a little impossible for you, but try to find a place, a regular time, where you can, you can spend time reading God's Word. It's very, very Important, And I love this verse right here. Right here. It says Joshua 1.8. Uh, this, is, this is what God uh, told Joshua before they went into the promised land. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall do what? This is a great, this is, this is a great guide for us. But we should do what? We should meditate on it day and night that you may have to observe to do all according to that sin written in it. And, here, and, here's, and, here's, and here's the result. This is like the old if-then-else statement in computer programming. You know, if, you, if this happens, then this. If that doesn't happen, else this. Okay, it's the if-then-else statement. So, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. For then, if you do all that, you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. That's a pretty good promise. That is a, that's an amazing verse. And so, but here's the prerequisite for all that prosperity and good success is that we have to meditate on God's word. We have to meditate on it. And so that's very, very important. Number two, as you read God's word, you need to spend time in prayer. That's it, where you begin to have a conversation with God. And it's not always one way. Take time to listen to God. But, and Matthew 6, 6 says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in, in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Man, what a beautiful, beautiful verse that is. So Reading God's Word and prayer is so, so important. Here's, an, here's another very practical thing, and I mentioned it earlier. <clears throat> location, location. It's important that we get in a small group. Why is that? We need people around you. We need people around us. I got to have people. I'm in a small I have to have people around me. What do they do? They help, they help bridle me. They help restrain me. They help. They check my thinking. They check in the way. You know, Randy, that's not quite, you know, I think you're thinking there. You need to adjust that, you know, and, 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 you know, and then it's an opportunity for me to bring things up, you know, maybe in my family, what I'm praying for, my kids or whatever. And so they're there. They're, they're a support group. They're helping me. And I'm also learning God's word. So uh, it's a, so important that we get in a small group. And because it says in Genesis, when, when he created Adam, God said, it is the first time he ever said something was not good. And he related it to a relationship and being isolated. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. That's when he created Eve. So God himself said, it's not good for you to be alone. I didn't say that. God said that. So it's very, very important. Here's the thing. If you stay isolated enough, you're just going to get flat out weird. That's just how it is. If I'm left to myself, I can get weird. Because, again, my mind can go all over the place. So any man or woman left to themselves, they're going to get weird. They're going to start thinking strange things because they're, they're unchallenged. Their thoughts are unchecked. And so it's very important for us to, uh, to not isolate and we see also, the Bible says in Acts, that, in, that and daily in the temple and every house, they, the apostles, did not cease teaching and preaching uh, Jesus as the Christ. So uh, there's wonderful things that take play, place in a, in, a, in a small group. We have small groups all over the place. They're at Starbucks. <laughs> they're at the Madeleines. They're in people's homes. They're at all kinds of places, and, you know, conference rooms and people's work. So it's amazing. And so I so appreciate our small group structure that we have here uh, at the church. No, and another one. Here's another thing that helps with this is stay accountable. Stay accountable. I mean, again, the reason why I need people around me is because I need, to, I need to stay in check. I need, I need to be accountable to someone, you know. And again, this is, this is, this is really interesting. 
Never forget this. You're only as accountable as you really want to be. I'm accountable. Are you really? I heard John Maxwell talk one time. He says, uh, he said, if you really want to be accountable, he goes, get you a three-by-five card. He goes, I don't want you to write down five things that you hope to God nobody ever asks you. <laughs> wow, huh? You write down five things you hope to, don't, hope to God nobody ever asks you, and this is what you do. You take that card, and you find somebody that loves you, that cares for you, that has your best interest in mind. You say, listen, I want you to ask me these five questions every now and then. Woo! That's big. If we start living like that, we'll be pretty accountable. You know, and that'll really uh, stay off a lot of calamity that sometimes happens in our lives. So stay accountable. The Bible says here, flee youthful lust in 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And here it is, along with those. That's other people. We're going to pursue all these wonderful things, not, not by ourselves. Listen, <laughs> even if you were a monk in a monastery, there's other people around you. There's other monks in there. They don't even do it alone, okay? I know they got the obscure person at times, but they're, by, they're with other people, okay? So if you want to pursue righteous faith, love, and peace, you got to do it along with those. Do it with other people who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, a pure heart. You get, you, it's so important for you to be around believers. I mean, if you're just coming out of the world and you have all these old friends, at some point, they're going to need to know that, you know, hey, bro, <laughs> you know, I just want to let you know that I'm a Christian now. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the things that I used to do, you know. I'm not going to hang out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do all. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a new, new place in my life. Christ has changed my life. They have, to, they have to hear what happened to you, and they're going to notice. They will notice. And some will join you, and some won't. This is how it is. So stay accountable. And here's, here's another very practical. Physically remove yourself from places of temptation. Physically remove yourself. Proverbs 4, 25, 27 says this. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. I remember when I was, I was, I think I was probably 16 years old. And um, I remember I was in church and on a Wednesday night, it's so vivid, and um, then I heard a message like this. And the name of it was, ponder the path of your feet. And the gist of the message was, are your feet in the right place? Okay, so I'm 16 years old. Boom, 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 boom. You don't remember anything like that when you're 16 years old. You're just thinking about, I'm going to go, you know, going to go hang out with my, my friends, and we're going to go to McDonald's, we're going to do whatever, you know. And so, but I remember, I, I remember distinctly that message. But it was brought to me later on. So years, years passed, and so I'm now, I'm going to college. I'm out doing my thing, right? And so I had to go to, uh, I had to go to a training seminar in Jacksonville, Florida. And, and so I was there, and, and I was with uh, three other guys, and we were in this kind of condo thing, staying there on the beach. It was really cool, beautiful. And uh, so every day we had to go to the seminar for a whole week. And so we're there, you know, all day in class, all day in class, all day in class, the seminar, you know. And so the big thing was, man, on Friday night we're going to hit the town. That's what my, my, the, the guys were saying, you know. And, uh, and so they, they were asking, around, hey, man, what's the best place? What's the best bar in town? What's all this, you know. And I'm hearing all this and going like, you know, <laughs> I would believe I'm going, hmm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm into all that. But I'm trying to be cool, trying to fit in, all that kind of stuff. You know, I was in my 20s. And so... Uh, so, and here's a, here, here was the deal. I had to rent a car, and I had the keys to the car, and I was the only one that was allowed to drive that car, so I had to drive them all around. So they asked around, so they got, they go, Randy, listen, though, we got the name, we're going to go to this place, it's outside of Jacksonville. They said, this is the really happening place. So I said, okay, so we all get out there, we go to dinner, and then we, then we were out, we just start driving out to this place out in the country somewhere. And so we're driving out there, and I'm, I'm not feeling so cool about it. We pull up, and, you know, so it's just kind of this, this big kind of cool place up on a hill, and I mean, cars were just rolling down the hill, I mean, just, I mean, just, just parked all down the hill, and it was like, I couldn't even hardly find a place to get in, it was packed out, the music was going, and it was happening, okay, I'm going, wow, you know, so I finally parked the car, and they're all, you know, they, they can't wait, and so 
they're, we're all walking in, and, uh, and so uh, I'm walking up. I remember walking up this hill, and, uh, and, uh, and so all of a sudden, I, all of a sudden, the Lord, the Lord just prompted this verse and this message in my head. I mean, I hadn't thought about that since I was 16 years old. It's probably 10 years later. And all of a sudden, that, that verse pops in my head, and this is what God spoke to me. He says, are your feet in the right place? I went, uh, for me, no. <laughs> okay? And I'm not saying, you know, you can't do, I mean, that's whatever, it's your, your conscience. But for me, I knew my feet weren't in the right place. And all of a sudden, I started feeling sick to my stomach. And I started slowing down. And all of a sudden, I remember that message. And here was the premise of the message. This was, and I, this is so amazing how God does this, how much he loves us. The premise of that message was, if your feet are in the right place, the rest of you are. If your feet are in the wrong place, the rest of you are. And I just, boom, that like hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm going like, uh, my feet are not in the right place for me. And so, uh, so I, I started slowing down and going, man, what's going on? I go, you know, <laughs> I mean, how do you tell a bunch of lost guys that the Holy Spirit's revealing the message from you when you were, in a, you know, 16 years old? How do you tell a bunch of lost guys that? I'm like, you know, <laughs> I... I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling good, and, you know, guys, I, I, th I think I need to go back to the house, you know. What? You can't do that, man. We're like 20-some we're like miles out of, out of town. You can't do that. I said, I got to go, man. I'm not feeling good, you know. Like, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. Catch a cab. We didn't have Uber back then. Just catch a cab. I don't know, you know. So they, they just, you know, huffed off, you know, and I got in that car, and I, was, I couldn't drive away from that place fast enough, you know. And I often thought about that, you know. I mean, I could have gone in there. It could have been innocent. Nothing could have happened, right, you know. But I think God was protecting me from something. There's no telling what would have happened to me up in there. And I remember they didn't get home until like 4 o'clock in the morning, and I heard them, you know, barrel coming in. They were all, you know, in their states. And, uh, and I heard him talking about me, going like, man, can you believe Randy did that? Can you believe that he left us like that? And the guy goes, I think he's one of those Christians. <laughs> and because I, and I, 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 I strategically had dropped hints, you know, all during the week. But anyway, and they didn't get the message. But anyway, so the point is this, is that if you begin to apply these practical things in your life, getting in a small group, staying in God's word, reading God's word, have a prayer life, stay accountable, and always ask and remove your, yourself from places of temptation and always ask yourself, are my feet in the right place? And if you do, some, if you do these things, I guarantee you, your life is going to begin to change. You're going to see a different way, a manner in, in, your, in your walk and how you relate to other people. And not only you will notice it, but other people will notice it too. So, so that concludes our lesson for this week. Let me pray for you. Father, I just pray for everyone uh, that's, that, that's gone through this lesson today, Lord. And I just pray that you're... Your, the Holy Spirit would just come inside. Maybe, maybe as people were listening to this, someone was listening to this uh, talk, that maybe they were convicted about something, or, they, 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 or there's a relationship they need to get right, or there's, there's something they need to do, they need to correct, something in their own life, or, or maybe they're, they're, they, they, they're, they're just renewing again, afresh, their, their desire to get in God's Word and to establish a, a routine prayer life and, and a word life, Lord. And, and I pray for, the, for each person. I pray for uh, their jobs and their family and their kids and, and whoever's watching this. I pray a blessing on them right now. And G, watch over, keep them, protect them in Jesus' name as they live out a sanctified, holy life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. Well, I'll see you next time as we go over lesson four in biblical foundations. God bless you, and we'll see you later.